Greetings. Much love to you. Welcome to Living in the Now, Tuesday, September 27th, 2011. And so far, we're all still here. Comet? What comet? (laughs) I don't know. I haven't had a whole lot of energy around that, so uh, we'll see how the days progress, won't we? And I have to say that energies are accelerating, and it's just getting to be more awesome and fun to watch play out day by day by day. Um, I have a few stories about what's gone on last week, but I'm actually going to wait, and I'll share those after the Santos interview, which I want to get into pretty quickly here. I know that some of you are familiar with Santos now. I only became familiar with him several weeks ago, thanks to my friend Joseph. And then it came to my attention through some other avenues also. And I know some of you are already familiar with Santos uh, Bonacci's work and research, et cetera, et cetera. And some of us just became acquainted. So for those of you who are only hearing about Santos right now for the first time, my interview gives a bit of an introduction to him, but he has hours and hours and hours of lectures that are available to you through him having posted them on his YouTube channel, which is Mr. Astro Theology on YouTube. And this was my chance to get a chance to talk to him one-on-one. And what a fabulous human being he is, as are we all. And one of the things that came up that I want to mention now that will come up again is that he has a reading list of about 80 books and he mentions that in some of his interviews, and I was finally able to determine where that list resides, and I've put a link to one of his sections of one of his YouTube videos that has his book list at the end of the video, and that's in the description page here. I'll paste it into the chat room for those who want it, but um, if you go to this particular YouTube video, which is titled... Astro Theology Part 12, The Science of As Above, So Below, Know Thyself. You, at about the 650 mark, you will find his list of books and the covers and all that kind of good stuff. So for those of you who are interested in that, that will come up in the interview also. So real quickly, as far as Santos is concerned... Um, He has been researching what he calls holy science. The ancient studies of the solar system were known as the solar science, and this knowledge was the basis and origin for all of our myths, legends, fairy tales, nursery rhymes, and folklore. This science was developed by a very wise, enlightened priesthood that gave us the holy books of all religions. Therefore, these studies also became known as the holy science. This language was heavily veiled in allegory and symbolism, and much of it was deliberately done to keep the higher truths from the masses. So for over 30 years, Santos Bonacci has been researching these ancient works, and now with his training in media and music, he continues with his study to compile and translate this marvelous knowledge into more accessible and contemporary term, terms. So he... <clears throat> excuse me, he... Um, like I said, has hours and hours of this, and you'll get a taste of it here. And if you want to follow up more, go check it out for yourself. And also, this was my opportunity to um, have a good conversation with him, and I know you'll enjoy it. So I'm not going to blather on anymore. Here you go. Enjoy, and I'll be back after the interview. I recorded this last Wednesday, by the way. Santos, what a pleasure to have this opportunity. How are you? I'm very, very well. That's good. Well, I have to say that you have created a buzz among some of my international Internet friends, as a lot of people have been discovering your messages. So thank you so much for that. Oh, look, that's lovely, I think. That's uh, lovely to hear, and thank you for a very warm welcome. So why don't you share with us a little bit of your background and tell us a bit about you, and then we'll get into some questions. <laughs> okay. Well, um, boy, <laughs> I can go way back, if you like. Um, I guess, well, I was 
I was born in the Victorian Alps in a little town called Myrtleford here in uh, Victoria, Australia. And my parents came out from Calabria, Catanzaro, in 1956. So both Italian uh, Calabrians, and they were single. They got married here. They met and got married in uh, 58. I was born in 63. So I have two elder sisters. Uh, and my mother was always pretty switched on. She started learning uh, English at the age of 14 when she came out, and she's very intellectual. She switched on. She speaks English very well. She saw a radio uh, show um, within two years of coming here about how immunisation was damaging many young children in Australia. Mm -hmm. So she, mm -hmm. she made a conscious decision not to immunise her children. And uh, then she was contacted by the Jehovah's Witnesses. I was baptised a Catholic in 65, but shortly thereafter my mum became a witness. Um, the message of the Jehovah's Witnesses appealed to her. My father converted. He was... Um, growing tobacco and in 1975 all Jehovah's Witnesses had to cease to have anything to do with tobacco so he had to sell his farm and um, that's pretty much the sort of um, uh, upbringing I had it was sort of mixed with all our Catholic relatives that came up and up to the tobacco plantations to grow tobacco so all my family's up there in Myrtleford it's only a three-hour drive from Melbourne. And uh, so I grew up with this Italian, Italo-Australian culture. <laughs> and, but also what else was strange was I was a Jehovah's Witness. So I uh, grew up as a witness, rejected the teachings at the age of 14, did all the uh, usual worldly things, chased girls, um, did all that stuff. And then at 18, I had another spiritual revival and I gravitated back to the Jehovah's Witnesses thinking that uh, they might have the true religion because that's how I was indoctrinated as a little boy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went back to the Witnesses and stayed there for about 22 years and quit in uh, 2005 because of just being absolutely deluded with this organisation. Um, there's some very, very strange goings on in the governing body. Very, very strange. They were NGOs of the UN for 10 years between 2001 and 2000, uh, sorry, 1991 to 2001 until they were exposed on the internet. Who, and they, I'm sorry, who, the, who they are you talking about? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. The Watchtower and Bible Tract Society. So a lot of things would, and I noticed their um, magazines were beginning to be favourable to the UN, which they had been denouncing for 50 years as the devil's organisation. But they were in bed with this organisation because they were NGOs. And uh, this was uh, revealed on the internet, and, and they hurriedly cancelled their membership with the UN as NGOs because of they were being exposed, you see? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of things were going on. There were stories about pedophilia uh, in Australia around about that time. There was a um, there was a uh, congregation in Melbourne here that was uh, hiding pedoph pedophile, and that went went on a show like sixty minutes, and that caused a lot of damage to the Jehovah's Witnesses. So they were in uh, damage control, and they wrote letters to the congregation saying, "Please do not bother with these stories." They are people who are trying to bring Jehovah's religion of truth down and they're trying to attack Jehovah. <laughs> you see, Jehovah has always got these enemies out there like the mm. devil who just wants to attack them because they are the true ones. Of course, the Mormons say the same thing and the Baptists and the Catholics and the Protestants and the Methodists and the Presbyterians. They all do. And they all tell you that the others are going to go to hell. So this is the sort of confusion that's going in there. But I was I was bewildered and I left them and I went to um, spiritual limbo for a couple of years until I started waking up. Now, I'd uh, done a lot of reading. I'd read up on uh, Emanuel Velikovsky since 1981, uh, Reen Norbergen, who wrote the book uh, Secrets of the Lost Races. I read up on Graham Hancock. 
Um, look, a lot of these guys, uh, Robert Lemesurier wrote a book about the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, and deciphering its true meaning. I was a big fan of Lemesurier. Uh, so I had done my reading when I was a Jehovah's Witness. I read the Bible backward. <laughs> I mastered that book. Believe you me, I mastered that book. I know everything. You can tell me a, a scripture, I'll know exactly which book it's from, whether it's Isaiah, the Psalms, Genesis, Revelation. And I'm so glad I did that because now when I started waking up in 2007, I read a book by Andrew Carrington Hitchcock called uh, The Synagogue of Satan. And there I learned about the Rothschilds and how much power they had in this world. And um, I didn't stop reading from that day, October 19th, 2007 and gladly uh, happily I had done my astronomy I'd done my um, geography um, I'd studied languages I speak French Spanish Portuguese um, of course Italian and Calabrese my dialect which I grew up with uh, I speak a little Japanese a little Greek and I learned how to read and write Kinet Greek, the ancient Greek. So I can do that. Um, and I'm glad I did all these things because when I started waking up and I saw a movie called Zeitgeist, of course you all know yes. the movie I'm referring to. And I love that product because they were so truthful, but um, but very limited. You know, they just, just they just scratched the surface of the astrotheology which exposed them to a lot of buffoons who know nothing about the true science that's in the Holy Scriptures, and they tried to debunk that guy. Now, when I saw this debunking going on, and I knew my astronomy, and I knew my Bible, and when I saw Zeitgeist and what they were saying, and then Jordan Maxwell and Michael Zarin, then I started reading all those other guys like mm -hmm. Gerald Massey and Godfrey Higgins and... Alvin, Alvin Boyd Kuhn and Manly P. Hall, um, look, Thomas H. Burgoyne, um, Volney and Dupuy, the writers for Napoleon who exposed the Christ myth. I read all these books. I read the, Rob, the Reverend Robert Taylor and his book, The Devil's Pul Pulpit, in which in 1980 he exposed the Bible as being astrotheology and went to jail for it. Of course, you get killed or go to jail when you start talking these heresies. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I started um, realising, uh, I mean, I knew that Zeitgeist was on the money, but they exposed themselves because they just scratched the surface. So I made some videos myself, which are, I think, <laughs> the only videos out there dealing with astrotheology that actually imparts to you, the listener, uh, the person watching the DVD, it imparts to you the ability to understand the science without having to refer to many sources. You can do it yourself. And uh, all you have to do is um, study the key which I have given, which is the key to understanding all the Bibles, all the nursery rhymes, all the uh, fairy tales, all the holy books and legends and poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Ennead and the Metamorphosis with one simple graph, with one simple sine wave. I mean, it's pure science. There is nothing in those holy books that is not science, that is not astronomy, that is not physio um, the physiology of man and, and the true nature of man, which is as above, so below. And so um, this is why I made my astrotheological videos. They are the most comprehensive, the most thorough. And look, I hope the buffoon who tried to debunk the zeitgeist will uh, watch my videos and just really, really just <laughs> get out there and apologize to the world for the damage, the absolute damage that this buffoon has done to people seeking the light who he has prevented from seeking the light because of his stupidity. And uh, Zeitgeist is 100% on the money. But my video, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, please, please don't get me wrong. 
I, I, I'm, I'm speaking like this, not out of confidence, pure confidence, that I know that what I've done is I've debunked the historical, fictional Christ story forever with my videos. There's no turning back. And I'm, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not the first, and I'm no, not the last. No. I certainly am not. But um, with my videos, you can, you can understand the whole lot for yourself rather than just guessing and, and uh, wondering whether, hmm, did Zeitgeist really get it right? Uh, is Jordan Maxwell correct when he talks about Jesus being the son and, and Michael Desarian and Godfrey Higgins and all these guys? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. And I prove it. I prove it. There's no doubting it after, after um, the proofs that I have given. And I've researched this uh, subject extensively. There's no doubt about it. Everything you read in the Bible, Jewish, Christian, is pure astronomy. It's a registry of astronomical phenomena. Look, I can quote Josephus who said that. Philus Judaeus who said that. I can quote um, Moses ben Maimon, one of the greatest Jewish scholars of the 11th century, praised second only to Moses himself, who said, please, please, when you see these grotesque stories in our books, please do not believe that they are literal, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. Please, don't make buffoons of yourself. And um, the, the great philosopher of the second century, Celsus, Celsus wrote a book on the true doctrine in which he exposed the Christians back then because he realized that this Judeo-Christian matrix that was the new kid on the block was going to do some damage and was had some very, very ill intents for global domination and land grabbing, i.e. the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, most of Africa, Africa, India and all these uh, colonial conquests were all done in the name of Christ. You cannot do these things unless you have a God or a, a hero that is going to support your bloodshed. You can't go around killing indigenous people when they came to the Americas, the Navajos, the, the Mayans and the Incas and all these people who were already in touch with nature and already had a religion, thank you very much, had to be converted by the edge of the sword. And who was this force that came up converting? Well, it was Christianity, the fiction of Christianity. It's actually the, the Antichrist. So, um, <clears throat> so um, you know, we need... We are, we are coming to a... To a stage in this beautiful life, this beautiful universe in which we live, whereby great consciousness is, is descending upon mankind. It has done in waves over, these, over the millennia. It has been doing it for millions of years on this planet. This planet has been producing races of men that have descended many times over. The great genius Walter Russell in his new concept of the universe says that he says exactly that, that we have been here doing this for millions of years. The earth has been a beautiful ovary of spiritual and physical creatures, and a blend of spirit and matter, because that's what we are. Mm -hmm. We have bodies composed of elements, what we call elements. Well, they're not substances, they're just motion. Now, there's 92 elements of the periodic table that do not have any substance at all, like a scientist, a consensus scientists erroneously teach because they are the um, students of effects. They don't have any idea of any of the causes and that they, they don't even care to study the causes. And uh, so we're dealing with motion and that motion is uh, the mind of the universe. The universe is mental, it's mind. And the mind is 12, the number 12. And the physical is the number seven. And we see these two numbers everywhere. Musically, there are 12 chromatic notes and seven diatonic tones, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, which we, we play and we exclude the five black notes of the piano 
and just uh, we we play the the five the seven diatonic notes, and uh, the five and the seven add to twelve. Twelve is the number of spirit. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. The twelve sons of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, Jesus' twelve apostles, King Arthur's twelve knights. They are the 12 warriors, the 12 fishermen, the 12 carpenters, the 12 workers with the sun, the 12 creators. And the seven planets, the sun, the moon, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Saturn and Mars, they are the dramatis personae that appear in all of our mythological texts, including the holy, so-called Holy Bible. Jesus is the sun, St. Peter is Jupiter, Zeus. John is Mercury. Uh, Mary Magdalene is the moon. Uh, Venus or Isis is the mother of Jesus. Uh, Joseph is uh, Saturn. And uh, Paul is Apollo. The characters are always there. They're always there. Only the people who go to church are not able to see who those characters are and never will. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's how they've been indoctrinated. You see, Rome knows. Rome knows how to uh, enslave mankind. Rome is a um, is the kingdom of ideas which has um, dominated this world for uh, 2,000 years. It's based on lies. Right, and I say that the gig is up. The gig is up. <laughs> it's up. It's been up for a long time, yeah. and now Rome, Rome is going bye-bye. You know, and, and that's what I want to talk about, because I want to talk about where we are now. Thank you for the, the historical perspective and sharing you know, who you are and how you got here and some of your background. Part of the issue of coming to this planet is that we go through this veil of forgetting. So there's so many of us remembering more, remembering more, remembering more, and the beauty of us being able to share our knowings with each other is really important. So I have a couple of questions about your knowings. You were just talking about how this planet has ascended humanity for time after time after time, but I'm understanding that this time is a little bit different than other times, and how would you describe that? You mean this time that we're living in is different to other times in the past? Is that mm-hmm. what you're saying? Yeah, because it's part of the evolution, so we're always evolving, and we've always been evolving. So there's an aspect of we're at a unique time on this planet. Don't you think so? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, we so are. We so are. Look, in the early 1100s, there were um, groups, the Jews in, in Spain from the, and the Arabs that were bringing over science and hermetic wisdom. Um, there, was, uh, there were the Bogomils in southern France and, uh, not, and uh, running around uh, Europe preaching hermetic wisdom. There were the Cathars and the Albigenses. There were the Sassinians in the 1500s. There were uh, the Waldenses, the Lollards, the, the Collagens. There were so many groups that were waking up and then the Renaissance, of course, happened there. But the Catholic Church has always been there. Fictional Christianity run by the elites of Rome has always been there to suppress the true wisdom, the great heresy, which is the wisdom of astrology, astrotheology, alchemy, Kabbalah, the wisdom of know thyself. The wisdom and the science of as above, so below. The holy science. The holy science is our natural spiritual religion. Once upon a time, there was just one religion on the earth. And that was the observance of the cycles of nature. And we were in harmony with those cycles. We respected the equinoxes and the solstices. We respected the holy days. We knew all. We were so in touch with nature. And then uh, we can go back to 3,500 years ago, the 18th dynasty of, uh, of Egypt, which is one of the most controversial and the most well-known dynasty. 
we can go back to there for when the fiction began. These people, these elite families, began to use uh, hierarchical um, theocratic systems of worship to enslave mankind. They saw the need to um, control the herd back then. Then came along the uh, Babylonians and Persians and they, they did similar things. There was still a lot of spiritual enlightenment, but there were groups coming through that were starting to have very, very theocratic tendencies. And uh, they used the power of theos. In other words, if you put a man at the top of this pyramid and you all climb this corporate ladder and you all try to become the pope, the leader, the head of the group, pyramids, pyramids, pyramids everywhere. They started teaching this pyramid paradigm where, where society had to climb. You had to climb up and get privileges and get more money. And if you be the CEO of this corporation, if you be the boss, you can get more money, more respect. If you be an elder in the congregation, you'll have more authority. One day, if you're a cardinal, you can be a pope. You can be elected. So this theocratic way of thinking came out of Egypt, out of some very per perverse entities that were starting to uh, enjoy the control that was coming through the uh, Silver Age, at the end of the Silver Age, the beginning of the Bronze Age, and of course the Iron Age of Rome, the Age of Pisces. And Rome perfected all of the mind-controlling, theocratic, Judeo-Christian, Eastern uh, Empire thinking, of control, mind control, Rome perfected it. Julius Caesar came along, JC, Julius Caesar means Jesus Christ. The whole Jesus Christ historical lie is founded on Julius Caesar and the Julians, mm -hmm. the seven Caesars. They were the first men to be adored as gods in this um, Iron Age. They were the ones who made themselves the son of God. Julius Caesar claimed that he was the son of God. Augustus did the same thing, and on his coins you will see him dressed with a crown of thorns. And you will see all these, um, all these eulogies and praises and epithets to uh, Augustus. A god has been born upon the earth, and a new calendar shall begin from his birth. You see, Anno Domini, Anno Domini, or... Um, common era did not begin with a historical Jesus. This is the the lie that Rome is founded mm. on. For buffoons to believe, buffoons that teach this rubbish from the universities, everything's a lie. It's all a lie. There was no historical Jesus Christ that started this common era. It was Caesar Augustus. That's been proven time and time again. But is anyone listening? Well, not the pro proletariat plebeian masses that Rome has created, slaves. And uh, the way Rome has done this is through its lies, its religious lies to steal our sovereign, true religion of nature away from us and to divorce us from nature, to give us uh, laws that are based on the high sea, the laws of commerce, when we go to court to a magistrate, they are administering trust law, you see. Right. Yes. And um, they are ex executing on our trusts. You see, the judge there is, um, is uh, counting on the fact that the stupid people that go to court do not know that they're walking into court as trustees. Therefore, they will be... Uh, they will be treated as such um, and they will carry the um, sh they will carry the shur surety for the um, for the fines or for the, the the jail sentence imposed on them you see because rather than walking into court with full dominion or even just writing to court and telling them that you're not going to turn up because those perverse so-called courts and nothing but a service by the mafia. See, the magistrates and the judges, you know, they are the wolves in sheep's covering. Have you seen the barristers from the Bar Guild? 
mm. who wear those who wear those woolly lambs wool sort of wigs. Yeah. Well, well, they are the she the uh, sheep's coverings of the wolves. These are ravenous wolves that are making money on our trusts because we go in and we think we're just um, little nobodies, you see. But we are the free men. We are the beneficiaries of the trust. We are the presidents. We are the CEOs of our trusts, the sole shareholders of our birth certificate SFKD trusts. And we appoint ourselves as directors. So that leaves trustees, employees, i.e. the government. We employ them. They are our servants. They are public trustees. And they listen to us when we go into court and we say that we are the general executors or the occupants of the office of general executor of the estate. You see, Rome doesn't want us to know that. Rome wants us to believe in their calendar, their language, its uh, capitalism, its uh, economical models, its uh, fascism. It wants us to believe in its uh, corporatism, its democracy, which is mob rule. Rome, it's a kingdom of ideas. And um, many of the buffoons who uh, want to don the, uh, the uniforms and the suits to climb that corporate, hierarchical, patriarchal, uh, corporate, theocratic monstrosity that these buffoon elite families have... Uh, have created and their time's up and they've built for themselves the beautiful FEMA concentration camps in which they will house themselves very very shortly as our eyes will see okay I still am not sure that I'm getting you to the place I'm trying to get you to <laughs> okay. sorry that's okay no that was great information essentially we are right now and we're in this time of the apocalypse you know the apocalypse being the lifting of the veil it's been prophesized you know, you said you're a scholar of the Bible, so revelations, you know, the, the apocalypse, the revelation, that's exactly what we're dealing with. So from that perspective and from your scholarly insight, interpret revelations for those who don't know revelations. How about that? Why don't you do that for me? You know, that, that explains where we are and what we're going through. Well, I would love for people to uh, read a book by James, James Morgan Price. Um, just one moment. It's just here to my left, The Apocalypse Unsealed, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's an esoteric interpretation of the initiation of John. So it's by James Morgan Price. And what it shows there that it's a book about an initiation. You see, John is initiated into the mysteries of the Christ, which is the mysteries of the know thyself. Um, but look... In Revelation, there is an element of eschatology in Revelation. Eschatology is end-time science. Eschatos in Greek means the end times. You see, because these scholars that wrote these beautiful poems, they were, were well-versed in the processional, um, the procession of the equinox, mm -hmm. the cycle of 24,000 to 25,920 years thereabouts. Now, it's coming to an end, and I will get to that because you're asking about these special, special days that we're living in. Right. These days are magical. The shift that is going on is exquisite. We are being initiated as a race into a higher consciousness. And when the age of Aquarius firmly in place, which will, will only be... We're in the cusp, by the way. We are in the cusp of the age of Pisces and Aquarius. We are being um, changed over to air, fixed air of Aquarius, and we're being converted from the uh, mutable water of Pisces, ruled by Jupiter. And we're going back to Saturn. Saturn rules Aquarius. Now, when we... Um, when we do finally come into those finer essences of Aquarius, we will uh, be enjoying a much higher consciousness. Now, it's the baptism of the Spirit that the Bible is talking about. See, the baptism of water happened in the age of Pisces. Pisces is the Christian age whereby we baptize ourselves in the mutable water of Pisces. Mm -hmm. But water is the universal solvent. 
it cleanses the hylic body. But it does not save. The baptism water is not salvific. Mm -hmm. Salvation comes from the word salt, just as the word salary comes from the word salt. The Romans used to pay their soldiers with salt, and that's where we get the word salary. And we still have a salary because Rome is the boss. That's why we still, we still earn a salary. We are slaves of Rome. If we didn't have jobs, we wouldn't be slaves. And we wouldn't need a salary. But salvation comes from the baptism of air. Air is the, uh, the spirit. You see, John the Baptist said, um, the one coming after me shall baptize in spirit and fire. Mm. You see, there are four elements. Earth, water, air and fire in astrology because the Bible is full of uh, astrology. Um, and the earth element is the baptism of the body which we have been baptized in. It is the baptism of death. In order to uh, return to the uh, cause where we came from, we need to baptize with the next element upward, water. Water cleanses the earth. And that is the baptism that Christians are up to. They have not partaken of the spirit or the fire. And the spirit and the fire is when one bursts the heart chakra and then when one bursts the pineal gland, that is the baptism of fire. And churchgoers will never enjoy this because they deny this. This science is from the devil. That's what they Yeah, I know. That's what they told me. <laughs> yes, yes. This is science that, oh, that's from the devil. The devil is teaching that to mislead people and take them away from Jehovah or from whoever the buffoon god that they've created, these imbeciles. And I must say this because the time left is reduced for these poor people. And if they're good people, as they say, oh, there's a lot of good, good people going to church. If they're good, really, really good, well, then they should um, look at their organizations and realize that by their fruits, they will be recognized. And um, take a look, good look at their hard look at their organizations. Perhaps go on the Internet and see how many cases of pedophilia have been backed up in the courtrooms, in the high courts of every country. And every one of these so-called Christian religions is guilty of this. They're right. They are abusive. Perhaps those good people going to church should have a look at this, a close hard look at it, and see that um, <clears throat> this so-called brand of Christianity... By the way, I am a Christian. I'm a Hermeticist. I'm a Christian. I'm a Kabbalist. I am a Neoplatonist. I am a uh, metaphysicist. I am an astrologer. I am an alchemist. I'm all those things because they're all one. But I am not a mind control opinionated church going buffoon. <laughs> and and they are the clowns that are that you're able to get to go and kill each other. You know, Martin Luther got plenty of his idiots to kill Catholics and they had a thirty year war. There was a bloodbath in Europe. They were killing people left, right and centre. They were killing Sicinians and Anabaptists and Bogomils and heretics and they were burning people and so-called witches by the millions, these so-called Christian corporations. Um, and you'll find that they're, um, <clears throat> they're involved in a lot of nasty activity and they are preventing the return of the Christ which is the beautiful consciousness which is descending upon us. But that's right. not possible. They can't prevent it. No, they can't, but they are. Look, what they're doing is <clears throat> they are pre preventing the critical mass, the point of critical mass from arriving tomorrow, for instance. We could have critical mass today if those churchgoers were just snapped out of their delusional mind control. Um, they could join us in, in this uh, freedom um, awakening and the reclaiming of dominion that we are that we are in in knowledge of um and they are not they're in denial of it they're in denial that this is going on they, they write people off like all oh, these new ages and then these twisted hippies and and whatever they are they just write them off you know they just um, they attack philosophers they attack anything they don't understand oh astrology is from the devil oh yes and how much do you know about astrology oh nothing but uh but i heard it from the priest 
and I heard it from the ac ac uh, the uh, academics who say that it's a pseudo science. Of course, of course, they'll say it's pseudo science. They're servants of Rome. Okay, here's where you and I differ a little bit, and we talked about this a little bit before doing this interview, and I have this conversation with many. Is that I am saying that there are enough of us. And as far as critical mass is concerned, I believe that we have, as a, as a population of the world and those that have awoken, is probably way more than was ever expected because we are so powerful and we're at this time, but we're still in the evolvement, so we haven't necessarily seen what you would define as a critical mass because we're not at that point yet, but we're moving toward that point. And I don't know exactly when that point is, but there are lots of predictions. I mean, there are predictions and dates and all that kind of stuff going around. But I have a sense that that, that real turnaround date really is like the equinox in 2013 or something like that, just from my own studies. But we continue to move, evolve, 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 and it's happening faster and faster and faster. And so I'm just the total optimist that... There's no way that it can't happen because of the cycles. The cycles show that we're moving into this, you know, we're moving out of a negative vibrating time into a more positive vibrating time, and that's how the, the cycles show it. So there's no way we cannot move there. Yeah, yeah no, that's true. You're right. You, actually, I stand corrected. You, you, What you're saying is far, far more true than what, than what I, I said. It is actually. I shouldn't be so. I, I shouldn't be so negative. Look, just I apologise. I, I am being uh, a little bit negative. We can um, <laughs> move to. Uh, I didn't really plan to uh, sort of go down that path and hammer the um, uh, the churchgoers and and whatnot. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're ta you're I, talking to an awake audience right now. So exactly. Exactly. I'm talking to the converted, and uh, it's, right. it's uh, yeah. So you are right. You're right, Kimberly. We um, yeah. We just need to perfect this now. That's all. Right, and that's what is important for us to be talking about. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. I think we should be dwelling more on that. I saw Sharp get uh, distracted here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that took me half an hour, but we finally got him there, folks. My <laughs> <laughs> yeah. fault. <laughs> yeah, right. I, could, I could get on with some more educational stuff, really, then. <laughs> some, some more, uh, you know, enlightening stuff. Like, I mean, it's wonderful for us to uh, acquire knowledge of the cycles. Now, that's where my expertise is. Mm -hmm. I wish I could just talk about that all the time. I would rather not sort of go down the explain, having to explain who Rome is and, and what Rome is and... and it's imminent destruction and everything like that. I'd rather dwell on the positive things and the beautiful cycles. Now, if we understand that we are the microcosm mm -hmm. of a beautiful, unfolding, unfurling, spiral macrocosm, we will understand all things. We will understand that all things are interrelated. We will understand the oneness of all things, the oneness of this beautiful universe that, that we are partaking of, the beautiful experience of this physical life that we're having. Our bodies are just vessels. They are vessels in motion. We acquire these bodies, we lose them. We acquire them, we lose them. We acquire them, we lose them. And it's a cycle, it's repetitive. And we go on and on acquiring these bodies and experiencing through these bodies. Sometimes we are born handicapped. Sometimes we are born blind. Sometimes we are born thieves. Sometimes we are born philosophers. And uh, we experience many, many, many ways and paths. And finally, we come to the, um, the knowledge of who we are. And we remember our divinity. And like the prodigal son, mm -hmm. we turn back and we lift our heads upward and we look at the stars and we say, well, please receive us because we want to return home. And we ask for, in the Bible, it's called we ask God for forgiveness. Well, forgive means to give. So if I, if you ask me, Santos, please, can you give me $20? I'm short of money and I need to eat and um, I'll pay you back. Well, that exchange of energy, that $20 that I give, that's a forgiveness. 
you forgive you, is giving. So we're asking God to give us what? Well, God is us in the causal world. We are God's becoming. So we are asking the cause to accept us back now and give us our and reinstate our relationship that we once had. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so like the prodigal son, he returns back to his father and his father greets him and says, look, come, come, my son. Uh, we're going to prepare a fattened calf for you and we're going to have a festival and we're going to rejoice and dance and sing because you have returned. And, um, and this is what, this is what we do. We reclaim dominion. You see, going back to the book of Revelation, the Revelation, um, now I just want to explain that the Bible is not just a, um, a book that deals with history and there's a little bit of um, symbolism in it. That's that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, and interpret the Bible. They say it's history, it's all pure history. Abraham was a historical person, mm -hmm. Noah was a historical person, Jesus was historical. And there is a little bit of spiritual metaphor in there. Well, they're right, but not completely right. You see, this is what Manly P. Hall says in the book, his little brochure called The Occult Anatomy of Man. He says, this brochure is devoted, in, on page 8 he says, this brochure is devoted to the problem of explaining the relationship existing between the symbolism of the ancient priests and the occult formation, functions of the human body. We must first understand that all sacred writings are supposed to be sealed with seven seals. Mm -hmm. In other words, it requires seven complete interpretations to, to understand fully the meaning of these ancient philosophical revelations, which we have liked to call Holy Writ. Scripture is not intended to be historical. Those who understand its literal meaning understand the least of its meaning. It is well, a well-known fact that Shakespeare, for dramatic reasons, brought together in his plays characters who had actually lived hundreds of years apart. But Shakespeare was not writing history. He was penning drama. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this was not entirely without purpose, for Shakespeare took license with history in order to present essential truths. So it seems the historians of Jesus used the character of the man as the groundwork for a great drama. He becomes the hero of a seven-sealed story. And those Christians who have studied symbolism can gain from that story the key to the true Christian mysteries. They will then realize that scripture is perpetual history, that it pertains to no nation or people, but is the story of all nations and people. peoples. It is a wonderful thing, for example, to study the life of Christ in the light of astronomy, for he becomes the sun and his disciples the twelve signs of the zodiac. Among the constellations, we find the scenes of his ministry. Now, now pay attention to that. This is beautiful. Um, among the constellations, we find the scenes of his ministries. Now, in my videos, I have proven this mm -hmm. beyond a doubt. There's no doubt. Everything that happens in the Gospels happens in the sky. It's all in the stars. And in the procession of the equinoxes, the story of his birth, growth, maturity, and death for men. Okay, so look, uh, I'll, I'll just read a little bit more. This, okay. is, this, is, this is important. We discover that the life of Christ, as found in the Gospels, has been conventionalized until it agrees perfectly with the lives of dozens of world saviors. For all of them are also astronomical and physiological myths. All of these myths come to us out of the most remote antiquity, where the primitive races used the human body as the symbolic unit, and the gods and demons were personified out of the organs and functions of the body. Among certain Kabbalistic writers, of the Holy Land is mapped out in the human body, and the various cities are shown as centers of consciousness in man. How beautiful it is. <laughs> uh, Kimberly, you will agree, when you understand these beautiful poems and the seven-sealed drama and their full interpretation, 
There's a physiological interpretation. There's an astronomical interpretation. There is an eschatological interpretation. There is an ethical story. There is a historical story. But the historical is not true history, you must understand. It's historical in the sense that you teach children the anthropomorphic notions of Christ being a man. The sun in the heavens is a man. So this man walks around in the circuit of Galilee and the Strong's Concordance tells you clearly that the circuit of Galilee is the circle of the zodiac and it's the sun. The sun goes through... Aries and Taurus and Gemini and as it does the seasons below change the nature of the seasons changes so this is the sun yes sus, going through the yearly cycle and the daily cycle and as he goes through he achieves marvelous things for instance the sun in the dawn is magnificent to behold. It is born of the waters and it rises in its full strength and the sunflower rises to greet the sun and the animals chirp and, and uh, run about and, and they become very, very agitated in the morning between six and eight. <laughs> and the sun, yes, and they greet the sun and the flowers stand erect and humans get about and run off to work and do things because the sun has risen, the saviour. And then the sun reaches the holy mountain, noon, 12, midday. And it's beaming rays of photosynthesis and bathing the earth with life and vitamin D for humans and, <laughs> and, and light for the eyes and sight for the wise so we don't bump into things and everything. And then the sun declines and it begins to darken and then it sets and the sun dies as it drops below the horizon. And there are the scales of Libra at 6 p.m. Every day, Aries greets the sun and in the sign of Aries, the zodi zodi zodiacal sign of Aries is Perseus, the slayer of Medusius. Every morning, Perseus, the sun, pulls out his sword and cuts off the starlit night. And all the stars flee when the sun comes up. They run and they are nowhere to be seen. And that Jesus, he walks with his twelve. And uh, then when he goes beyond <clears throat> the scales of Libra, he goes down through the scorpion in November, goes down through Sagittarius and gets pierced with the arrow of the, uh, the centaur and he dies on the 21st of December. But then the sun three days later, rises out of the tomb and on the 25th of December, the holy Christmas day, the sun is born. And that is the festival of Deus Invictus Solinatis of the Catholics, the day of the unconquered, invincible sun. And they call that one Jesus Christ. And he begins to climb up out of the tomb and it takes him three days until he is resurrected. And he's always resurrected at Easter. And the three days are the signs of Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. And the sun, when it climbs up out of those three days into the sign of Aries, the sign of the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, it uh, blesses mankind with the blossom, the sperm of the sun and the beginning of the fruitful season. And those cycles are there for us to respect and love and cherish and understand and master and uh, but um, you see Christianity based on the historical Christ denies these truths mm. it denies that it's that its whole theology is based on these on this nature and yet I have exposed it like many others have exposed it I'm standing on the shoulders of Gerald Massey um, Percy Graves Acharya S Jordan Maxwell Michael Sarian Mm -hmm. Alvin Boyd Kuhn and all these marvellous, marvellous scholars who have exposed this and, and the many, many thousands more that I haven't even mentioned. <laughs> I've read hundreds of these scholars, hundreds of them. And you, if you want a really good website for, for learning about um, the, the, true, the true story in the Bible, go to Bet Emmett Ministries. Bet, B-E-T, 
Emmett is E M E H T Ministries, and they have got a wealth of information. But I would recommend that you see my videos first because you really, really need to see the science and understand how all of astrology and astrotheology is based on simple electromagnetic science. So I'll, I'll have a breather. I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you may. Might want to ask a question or something i'm sorry no it's okay okay so what you know what's your vision you know what what, what is it going to look like a year from now what is it going to look like two years from now what's your perception well you you'll probably notice that your world your internal world is getting better by the day isn't it mm -hmm. it's getting more and more beautifully conscious and awakened your internal your christ-like conscious self is growing um, but your external world seems to be deteriorating and that's the phenomena that everyone around the world is experiencing um, <clears throat> the awakened ones certainly their path of awakening will not um, will not be retarded it will not be uh, relented it will it will just grow exponentially yeah, there's no turning back once you get to a certain place <laughs> no <laughs> no, there's not. There's not. And um, and uh, as the Hermetica says, when you become, when you are baptized in the higher mind of the spirit, and you become a mystic, because mystic means fire, and fire is the pineal gland, and that's what you have to open mm -hmm. and rise, raise. When that crown chakra is is glowing and uh, you receive direct knowledge from above you see there's no more opinions there's no more psychic you see the christians who are baptized in water the, the the gnostic christians had a system of hylic psychic spiritual and mystic and they correspond with the four elements earth water air and fire so the earth people who are concerned with their flesh their bellies material things eventually must become psychics they must reach the second level and have a baptism of water but this is the problem with christianity and churchgoers is that they've been, they've been baptized into this higher consciousness from the lower mind but it, it's still not the higher mind it's still the lower mind they are still trapped in the lower psychic mind it's a psychic salvation that they have experienced but it is not sufficient for salvation. It's not sufficient for, for growth into the uh, spirit astral kingdoms, which we will inherit as we, uh, as we um, transmute our energy. These people will be, they'll be tricked. They'll be, they are deceived. They're mind controlled. They're kept in their lower minds. They have not experienced the spiritual awakening of the air, the baptism of air, the baptism of spirit, and then the one of fire above that, which makes them a spiritual and a mystical. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, you are babes in the Christ. I cannot speak to you about the deep things, the deep secrets of Christ, because you are drinking the milk of the word. You still see him as a man, as the children see him. See, the children were taught that he was a man. Uh, under the age of 12 they were taught this and then they were supposed to be initiated into the into the understanding the higher understanding that it's, that it, there's seven there are six more levels mm -hmm. awaiting mm -hmm. and unless you awaken to those levels your corresponding chakras will not will not awaken and your energy will remain low and you will not receive of the higher consciousness and be saved remember that word salvation which comes from salt because salt preserves. Yeah, can I stop you there for a second? It's not being saved from the outside in, it's from the inside out. Save, yes. thy, save thyself, you know, it's not from receiving something from the outside, it's from emanating from the inside out. Don't you think? Oh, oh of course, yeah. Well, it's not about, uh, it, it's about knowing this. I don't mm -hmm. think it. I know that, mm -hmm. that. And you obviously know that, and that is the truth. Mm -hmm. That is how it is. It's uh, it's no other way. There's nothing out there that is greater than what is in there. If we start believing that, Walt Whitman said, and nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. 
Alfred Lord Tennyson said, self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control, these three alone lead to sovereign power. And when you go to church, they take away your self-reverence and they divert it to a, a historical, perfect model, Jesus Christ. So you're going to forever be um, missing the mark, trying to be as good as he was. So self-reverence, bye-bye. They don't, they, they don't uh, take that into account. They don't allow you to revere yourself. Self-knowledge, as the Oracle of Delphi said, Know thyself. Know thyself. And self-control, well, do they have self-control? I don't think so. I think they're very abusive. And all this pedophilia that's coming out and all these court cases, I think it shows that. And I think they're uh, marauding capitalists, like uh, the Reverend uh, T.W. Doan said in the 1800s, these Christians, they are marauding capitalists. And uh, I think they are materialists. They're not spiritualists at all because they deny the true Christ, which is the Christ within. And the Apostle Paul, one of their own teachers, tells you that the Christ is within, not without. It cannot be without. So I was talking about the self-reverence and everything like this. See, this is where we begin to reclaim our dominion and we understand that we are the um, we are divine children of, of the divinity. Mm. But that's our natural inheritance. There's no mistake about it. The Catholic Church and the, the Roman cult has stepped in as the um, as the administrator and executor of our trusts. You see, that our trust is with God. God is the one who gave us the dominion. He said, uh, everything on the earth is yours. Right. You're free. And all you have to do is obey my law, which is don't harm. Do not harm. When you start harming with intent, you are sinning against nature. Nature does not, does not respect that. Harm is not loving. And, 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 that's, and that's all our obligation to, mm -hmm. to God and to our neighbours and to ourselves. If we do not harm, there is no sin, there's no crime. So why do we keep getting dragged into the, at the courts? Because we were speeding. Where does God's law say... <laughs> you know that you, if you are doing four miles over the the limit, you should pay one hundred and seventy dollars to the um, to the Vatican bankers who are sitting on the bench yeah. as magistrates. Yeah, and I wish we had you know hours and hours, but we don't. So let's not go down that path. Right. Now. <laughs> yes. But anyway, for those who are just being introduced to Santos, he has hours and hours. Trust me, I've spent quite a few hours. <laughs> going through Santos's information. So this is a real quick question. You talk about your book list being on your website, but I couldn't find it. Where am I missing it? Okay. Um, my 80-odd books, which I've recommended for researching and referencing my, the, the, uh, everything that's on my, my video presentation, is on my, the first video presentation that I ever made. It's called The Key. And it's on my Mr. Astro Theology YouTube page. My YouTube page is Mr. Astro Theology. One word. And in there you'll find a, a video. I have nine videos. One of those videos is called The Key. Um, now, I think it's part 12. It's an eight-minute segment, part 12, the final part of that video. Right to the end of there, I have... Um, put a list of 80 books and I have, I've tried to put them from the very, very most important and pertinent to the subject first and I've put the, the best ones for, for acquiring really good, rich knowledge first. So you can pretty much grab the first 20 and go for knowledge in those books is, is quite... Um, Conscious liberating. Okay. Conscious. I wasn't. I wasn't signing in, and there's been discussion about that. Okay. So, all right. This is an added insert into this interview because it took me a little while to find the book list. But here's the deal. Mr. Astro Theology is the YouTube channel, and the title of the video is Astro Theology Part Twelve: The Science of As Above, So Below, Know Thyself. I've put the link into the description page of this interview. 
However, again, the actual title of the video clip that has the book list at the end of the video is titled Astro Theology Part 12, The Science of As Above, So Below, Know Thyself. That was an easy question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This came up from several people. So there are lots of different perspectives about the moon. And the group of people that I'm in, in conversation with, we often have discussions about the moon, and there are different people who have different views of it. For example, David Icke has some perspectives on the moon being a craft or being artificially manufactured versus organically manufactured. And George Kavasilis looks at it that way. Some groups, including African tribes, say that they were here before the time of the moon. So there are historical references of being here before the moon was here. And so that was a question for you, what you think about the moon. Mm. Yeah, look... Um I have read the book Who Built the Moon by Christopher Knight and uh, I don't know whether he wrote, co-wrote that with Lomas, uh, but anyway, Christopher Knight and uh, Who Built the Moon. And I know of um, Cavasilis, George Cavasilis, who says that uh, the moon comes from the Pleiades and it's a uh, seeding vessel and it has seeded uh, and birthed created many races of men throughout the galaxy. I know that. I know that the Rishis taught that when we leave this planet, we go to the rings of the moon first. We go to the moon sphere, which is just below that of Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, then Saturn. And this is the Jacob's Ladder, which... Um, Plato spoke about, Hermes spoke about, um, Macrobius spoke about it in his commentary on the dream of Scipio. Uh, Cicero wrote about it. They all did. They all wrote about this ladder. And the moon is always there at the bottom. That's the place where our souls come, descend to this earth. And the moon rules the zodiacal sign of Cancer. And Cancer is the closest point to the Earth of the zodiacal um, ecliptic. Um, because, of course, the Northern Hemisphere is pointing toward Cancer on June the 21st, the solstice, the day that the Sun enters the sign of Cancer. And since Cancer is so close in that sense, they place the Moon in Cancer. Because, mm. because she is the closest orb to the Earth. And the furthest sign is the Tropic of Can Capricorn. It's opposite. And Saturn belongs as the ruler of Capricorn. And Saturn is the furthest of the visible planets. And therefore, Saturn gets to uh, be housed in the sign of Capricorn. And in Macrobius' uh, commentary on Scipio's dream, he says there that souls depart from that gate. That's the gate of the gods. And souls enter from the ovaries of the solar system, the moon, from the Tropic of Cancer. And so this cycle is, uh, the processional cycle, is the wheel of necessity which our souls have incarnated into and which are evolving our souls as we prepare ourselves for ascension. So what's your definition of ascension? Well, ascension is uh, receiving the higher consciousness and um, going to live in the higher chakras, the octave of chakras above the physical octave that we live in. You see, as I said before, seven is the number of, of nature, of the physical material world. And 12 is the number of spirit. And, um, and the seven chakras in our, the seven spiritual wheels that are in our body, the bottom most chakra, the, uh, the base chakra, has four petals. And the next chakra has six. The next chakra has ten. And then the, ch the heart chakra has twelve. 
The throat chakra has 16 petals. The next chakra has 96 petals. Those numbers amount to 144. That's a Fibonacci number. It's also 12 times 12. And um, it's the number that's in Revelation chapter 14 that says, and the 144,000 marked and sealed in their foreheads will be will be saved and will go to to heaven now the top chakra the seventh has one thousand petals it's the one thousand petal lotus and that number one thousand multiplied by the below numbers 144 make 144,000 so that number that magic number when the saints go marching in oh lord how i want to be in that number (laughs) Well, that's that's the number of our burst chakras. If they are not all burst, they, we will not ascend because we will not have the right energy. We will uh, continue to reincarnate. And so that's what ascension is. Ascension is getting out of here. We're going home. We're going back to the start. There's no turning back. And it's only a matter of time. So, And, and, it's, and it all depends on how quickly we can uh, grow our consciousness. And that's why I'm sharing that holy ancient science with people because it is the true religion of ascension the science of as above so below Mm -hmm. and the know thyself science the holy science it is not what they're teaching in the churches what they're teaching in the churches goes against it it's the antichrist Mm -hmm. they they are corporations doing business they're more interested in making money than uh, and they're interested in, in in abuse emotional spiritual and physical Okay, thank you. And this question is asked by many over and over again, and so we wanted to hear what you had to say about this. In this preparation that we're, you know, moving into 2012, et cetera, et cetera, it says, what can those that are not able to hear this message or interested in it do? You know, those with good loving hearts, how do we guide them and assist them so the impacts to them are less stressful. Well, yeah, that's that's a really good question, isn't it? It's a good question. We need to reach out. Uh, we need to let our light shine, as the gospel say. Do not hide your light. Mm-hmm. Let that light be known. Let let it be seen. And we can only hope that um, they will um, awaken at the right time. You see, the uh, ancients used to say that when the student is ready, the master will appear. Now, all of a sudden, right on cue, just before the end of the processional age, on the 21st of December 2012, all of a sudden we see people, knowledge is just abundant. We have the internet. Yeah. We, have, um, we have great independent scholars who are not indoctrinated and paid by Rome to tell lies. Um, we have such amazing knowledge that we never had before and we can see we can see with our own eyes clearly that there's a great awakening going on it's great Mm. it is so majestic it is beautiful it's nature it's it's the human race coming of age you see when the age of aquarius comes so does the age of leo the autumnal equinox will be in leo for two thousand years now and that sphinx in Egypt has been waiting for 24,000 years to see its day come back. You see, the virgin's, the virgin's face and the lion's body, the sphinx, the riddle of the sphinx is that, that when the age goes round and round and round for 24,000 years and returns to the uh, beginning point, which is when the equinox goes from Virgo to Leo, you see... We've been in the age of Pisces because the um, vernal equinox has been in Pisces for 2,000 years. But the opposite equinox, the autumnal equinox, has been in Virgo. And um, it is handing over to Leo. And Leo is the heart. You see, Virgo is the belly. We have been in the belly, so Mm -hmm. to speak. We've been in the belly chakra, the solar plexus, for 2,000 years. When Leo comes, there's a star in Leo called um, Regulus. It's the brightest star in the constellation. And the Arabs call that the Messiah. That's the return of the Messiah. That's the heart chakra being pierced as a race. 
as a race when Leo arrives, and it's and we're on the cusp of Leo, the golden age. It's coming. Uh, we're yeah, on the cusp of. What's the date of that? What's the date of moving into Leo? Well, well, it will be twenty uh, first of December, twenty twelve. There's no doubt about it. Um, there are people who are saying, "Oh no, it's five hundred years away." Oh no, it's still forty years away, or two hundred years away. And uh, of course, we were singing about the uh, dawning of the end of the quest back in the 60s mm. um, um, and we, we had people saying like Alistair Crowley I think I'm not sure don't quote me on this I think he was saying that it was uh, it was upon us um, there were a lot of um, great teachers who were teaching that Aquarius was upon us in the 60s and 70s um, but um, I, I tend to go with the processional wheel and I think that will be more accurate uh, and um, I would say that uh, the pure, the 51 percent of of Aquarius cusp uh, will begin on 21st of December 2012. What I mean by 51 percent is that uh, Aquarius will be stronger than Pisces in the cusp. We may not be fully in the age of Aquarius by then, but definitely it it will be it will overpower the essences of and the energies of Pisces definitely. Definitely, right on cue, right on cue with the sessional months. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, everything is to cycle. It's all on time. It's all going according to schedule. Yeah, you know, basically, as, this is the way I look at it real quickly, is that, as I was saying earlier, is that there's no way that this can't happen because it's part of the cycle and cycles happen and there's nothing that we can do to stop it but what we have the choices is we can make it we, it can be easy on us or and it can be a blast or it can be hard on us <laughs> you know that's really what it is and you know I'm having a blast and watching this play out and it cracks me up daily and so when I hear new information that you have delved into I, I'm, I've been calling you a walking encyclopedia of, of historical knowledge, and so thank you for that. It's a lot of fun. There's nothing we can do to stop this. You have the choice. If you if you know thyself and know your sovereignty and know your greatness, you can have a really good time with it. But if you continue to listen to what other people are telling you, then you're going to have a rough time of it. It's that simple. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah. People, unfortunately, suffer with a head full of opinions. They suffer. Mm -hmm. Greatly because they cherish their opinions. Yeah, and their yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. and their judgments. I mean, that's the other thing. Let go of the judgment, and then you're free too. Yes, um, uh, Kimberly, the greatest, um, the greatest fiction that has harmed mankind more than any other is the one that I expose the most, and that's the historical Christ fiction. Mm -hmm. That one has harmed mankind so much. How gullible we are to think that two thousand years ago came along. This man, who is the son of God, born of a virgin, and all these unusual miracles that he does and, and things like that, goes contrary to nature's laws and performs miracles. And his religion comes along and debunks every other religion that has been on this planet for thousands and thousands of years. In Egypt, they had a very, very refined scientific slash religious system which was called the holy science of as above, so below, and it was true Christianity. It was based on nature. They understood how the soul returns. They embalmed souls. They understood, they understood what would make you become a, uh, a spiritual wise person, and they, they understood the science of transmutation. And all of a sudden, just 2,000 years ago, comes this prophet slash son of God and everything, and debunks, all of them, and they're all, all of a sudden they're all wrong and they're all from the devil. And this has harmed us so much. And ever since that time that Rome has perpetrated this falsification of history upon us, Rome has taken, upon, taken it upon itself to go and destroy all of those so-called pagan temples, temples to Jupiter and Juno and Mithras and, and all of these, um, universities and mystery schools, they shut them down, they burned down libraries, Alexandria was burned down, Hypatia was killed, they went after the philosophers, they went after the knowers, they went after the psychics and the people who knew the holy science, the hermeticists, 
they had to go underground. Rome went to pillaging and destroying to hide all the evidence. But their myth, their fiction about Jesus debunking all of those religions um, goes on because they've destroyed the evidence, haven't they? Mm. Very <laughs> clever. Yeah. Very clever. And they still do that. They've done it in the Americas. They decapitated the mind culture. They book burned all their books yeah. to the point where there's only four books left. Why? What did they have to hide? Mm -hmm. Did the Mayans have science slash religion that was beyond what these buffoons could ever dream up? At that time, they were still getting over that the earth wasn't flat. <laughs> these yeah. Christians, and they're still teaching lies. That they teach the, um, that the sun is the uh, center of the solar system and the planets rotate, they orbit around the sun on the same plane. That's a, lot of, that's a load of hogwash. The planets do not orbit around the sun. They orbit with the sun. The sun is spiraling through the heavens like everything. Everything is a spiral. The atoms in your body, neutrinos, galaxies, uh, nebula, everything. Everything is in spiral motion. And our sun is no exception. Why would it be? It can't be. Nothing can go against that universal law of, of um, the, the Fibonacci spiral ratio. Nothing, nothing can go against it. There's nothing. The, the, our sun cannot be an exception. Therefore, our planets cannot be orbiting the sun. They are following the sun, orbiting with the sun in its, vo in its vortex um, solar system. And this is the sort of stuff that needs to be debunked because there are scholars out there like Walter Russell and... Uh, Keshava Bahat, the Indian uh, scholar, there's um, Nassim Harriman, and these people who are showing how um, <clears throat> the truth about... And, and look, Rome is still the one that is continuing to teach Kepler and uh, Copernicus and uh, the new um, heliocentric um, so, um, solar system um, model. It's all wrong. Everything that Rome teaches is wrong. It's all of it. All of it is wrong. Capitalism, democracy, the lot of it. It's all perverse and it's all going bye-byes because we're waking up. Yep, like I said, the gig is up. <laughs> Fat light is something. <laughs> and it's fun to watch. It's fun yeah. to watch it crumble. So that's the, you know, that's the show. I'm in, I'm enjoying it. I'm having a blast. And thank you, Santos, so much for all of the fabulous research and it just you know when i hear some of the new statistics that i didn't know before of course i knew a lot of them but there are a lot of things i didn't know and that's so fun it's like wow how oh i love that part oh that's so great putting that p another puzzle piece together with another puzzle piece so thank you so much for that and i also want to real quickly be sure to thank you for your beautiful music I think your album sales are going to go up a little bit because we've also been playing your music around and that is absolutely my favorite part of you. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Your real energy comes through, obviously, through your guitar. So, so quickly, for those who haven't, don't know that you are such a fabulous guitarist musician, why don't you just tell them a little bit about the background of that before we go? Well, I'm, I'm a, um, a professional musician, a flamenco, Latin, jazz, guitarist, instrumentalist. I don't sing. Um, and I do street performances, mostly shopping centres. Today, I was in the hub of the city of Melbourne, the Burke Street Mall, and I was performing and selling my CDs. I did not have a very good day, mind you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think I sold about uh, nine CDs or something like that, which is really pretty tough because you've got to pay for parking and petrol and all of that. And so, but look, I have uh, good days. I, you know, can sell my, you know, sometimes 100 CDs in a day. If I have a good day, I can sell 150. I can sell 80, 60, 70, as you know, depending on how um, how well I play and how much energy I put into it and time. Uh, so look, I'm not complaining. I've had a bad day today, but. Um, um, I'm going back on Friday and I've got Saturday booked, so I've got three days this week and um, I enjoy it. I get to uh, connect with people directly and the people who like my music stop, people who don't just uh, keep going and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to play to a captive audience that, um, 
that perhaps uh, does not like my genre of music at all. So I'm curious, I haven't had the opportunity to really talk to somebody about this. You sell CDs on your yeah. com is where you can buy physical CDs. But I'm just curious, do you make more money from physical CDs that you sell or how does that compare? Like I bought one of your albums off of Amazon the other day. Um, I'm just curious how that works financially for your benefit. Um, well, Amazon and iTunes pay... Um, Royalties on how you how well you sell and everything like that. I don't do a lot of um, I don't do a lot through them. Uh, I I do a, a bit, but I mean, if I put it this way, if I don't go out and do street performances, I won't uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't be singing <laughs> okay. because that's ninety percent of my income. All right, thank you. Yep. Well, Santos, I don't know what else to say, but thank you, much love, much love, and I just wondered if there's anything you want to say in closing. In closing, I would just like to encourage people, please, to have a look at my videos on YouTube. And uh, if you like them, to, um, to send them on to other like-minded people who might appreciate this knowledge. It is, it is absolutely the only solution. I can say that with confidence because the science of know thyself is the only way that we can um, go, go forward from here as a race and to know and reclaim our divinity. And what will follow will be the famous Sat Chitananda of the Indians. Um, bliss, consciousness and existence. And that is all that our hearts and souls desire. There's only three desires that we ever must fulfill and that is bliss, existence and consciousness. So let's expand our consciousness. Let's grow in bliss and let's exist forever because we are immortal and we are stars becoming thank you hmm. thank you Woo <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right well thank you so much for this late night interview for you please stay in touch if i can be of any service let me know yeah look thank you so much kimberly and uh hopefully we'll talk soon and do this again okay great perfect yeah, Great. thank you. Yep, have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, there you have it. Stentos Bonacci. And all of his information is in the description page here. And the way to support him, obviously, is to buy his music. Uh, whatever way, shape, or form you're led to do that. And I see that someone is on Skype who said that they wanted to speak to the host. And if that is still the case, they've been sitting there for 45, 40 minutes or whatever. But before I pick up that call, if that person wants to speak or not, I wanted to play a song, a Santos piece. And this is from his album, Amazing Days. The song is titled Sweet Thing, for those of you who have not heard his music yet.
All righty. Santos Bonacci, and that was from his Amazing Days album, and the title of that particular song was Sweet Thing, and he has several albums, and people are asking for recommendations. I haven't listened to them all yet, but I'm planning on getting more. Great dinner music from my house because my family doesn't want to play music with lyrics because I start singing and it's kind of disruptive. So if we have great instrumental music for dinner, <laughs> everybody's happy. So listen, there are a couple of things. I'm going to play something here, um, or actually I'm going to read something here for you. There was There's a woman by the name of Reverend Angela Paragoff, I'm not sure if I'm saying that or not, who was brought to my attention recently, and her website is angelaparagoff.com, A-N-G-E-L-A-P-E-R-E-G-O-F-F, -F. and she's also on Facebook under Reverend Angela Paragoff, and she puts out a weekly, what I would call, energy report, and I know some people are familiar with that, and I just became familiar with a couple of people sharing it lately, and the one that she posted for yesterday's date for this week was right on track with what Santos was talking about, and I'm here saying day after day after day, congratulations, you know, we did it. It's not like, you know, we continue to do it, but we did it, and great job. Keep shining your light and use your voice, and I have realized that I've been silent with some people around me for most of my life. I haven't ha had to be silent here, <laughs> you know, but like speaking to those of like mind, but I've tended to be silent with many around me, particularly biological family, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been starting to send them things and say things, and there's no holding back. So it's time for us to shine our light and let people know what's going on and not worry about it, whether they think we're crazy or not, because if I'm crazy, then you're crazy too, <laughs> and that's probably a good thing. But before I play that, which is about, because um, I pre-recorded it, but anyway, I wanted to tell you a story that I haven't really spoken to too much. Back in March, I listened to an interview with Sean David Morton, and he's a fabulous person. I'm sure some of you are familiar with his work, but I wasn't until you know the beginning of this past year. And actually, it was Carrie Cassidy who did an interview with him. And in that interview, he's multifaceted with information and another walking encyclopedia person. So I started looking into his work, and one of the things that was mentioned in his interview with Carrie was a book that was being released. I believe it was released in March, and the title of the book is Sands of Time. And Sands of Time is a 500-page book that I didn't get a chance to pick up and read word for word, all 500 pages, until the summer, beginning of, I guess it was the beginning of July that I picked it up. And it took me about a month to get through it, um, and I actually spent quite a bit of time reading it. Anyway, so it's a story about time travel. It's a story about black ops operations going back into the 40s, and I'm going to talk more about it at another point, but it was a culmination of so much information that has been withheld from us that I've known and I've seen pieces and puzzle pieces here and there and heard them from different perspectives, but this was the story of a man who gave this story to Sean back seven years ago and was told that when the person whose story it is passed on or was no longer here, that he could release it. And so he released it in March. And I, like I said, I didn't get a chance to read it until July. And then I started recommending it to a couple of people and recognized that the book was no longer available anywhere. I could, it was, there was no trace of it whatsoever. And so at the beginning of August, I started writing to Sean through the only address that I had, which was through his website, and I didn't get an answer. I even wrote to Carrie Cassidy asking her what had happened to the book. I got a friend involved who's a moderator on Carrie's, uh, actually, um, Shaska, um, Shaska, and anyway, who's in Peru, and I asked him to get in contact with her. Nobody would write back to me. So it was one of those things where I have learned my lesson well that when things are meant to happen they're meant to happen and even though I had this deep desire to know why the book had disappeared 
and I didn't let go of that. But you know, you got to be, you got to let go of things, and you can keep putting it out there. Well, lo and behold, last week um, I woke up one morning and I had an email from a friend who didn't know anything about me trying to get in touch with. Sean had no clue. As a matter of fact, this guy, his name is Mark, and he's in Australia, and he's been helping me connect with some other people. Out of the blue, I get an email, and he says, oh, by the way, Sean David Morton is a friend of mine, and if you want to get in touch with him, he has this really good book out, Sands of Time, that I had the manuscript on, and you would really be um, interested in that, etc., <laughs> So I start cracking up. So he gives me his direct email and Sean, and also Sean's phone number. And so I immediately write, I've been trying to contact you for two months, and I want to know what happened to the book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I, I got a letter back from Sean very promptly, and essentially I'll read it to you. It says, Dear Miss Kimberly, hey there, hi there, ho there. Um, a pleasure to finally connect with you and you have my apologies that I have been so difficult to get a hold of. There have been some issues regarding Sands of Time concerning the sensitive nature of the book and the secrets it contains. Um, I've had to do some proper copyright work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, before it goes public again. And he said that it will be coming soon. Sands of Time will be coming out as a hardback limited edition in the next few weeks. So we went on in Central, and we actually talked on Friday because he was one of the speakers at the Awake and Aware conference this past weekend. So I'll be having an interview with him, and we'll be talking more about the book Sands of Time. It's still not available to buy it yet, but when it is, I couldn't recommend <laughs> a more fascinating, interesting book, that's for sure. All right, real quickly, somebody does have... Uh, that's on Skype, their hand went down and now it's up again, so let me just check and see if somebody's here. Hello on Skype? Uh, Hi. Hello. Hi. You know, I've just been listening. It's been great. Oh, okay. Did you want to say something? I didn't know if you were doing readings or... uh... Oh, no. Is he always a performer or does he um, actually, um, you know, get tickets and that kind of thing too? Um, he's a street performer in Australia, in Melbourne. Cool. So, yeah, I, I'll, anyway, if you just uh, Google Santos Bonacci, Santos, B-O-N-A-C-C-I, you'll find a lot of information about him. Oh, swell. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Okay, so now I want to play, like I said, I pre-recorded this. Angela's message, and it's a message that was posted yesterday, so I think you'll enjoy this. I know maybe a couple of you have already read it, but here you go. We end the month with a week of the old order changing to the new, which will encourage all to feel upbeat, creative, and peaceful. No doubt you experienced a dash of drama here and there last week, but hopefully it gave you some positive direction for your spiritual path in life. With the exception of a couple of days this week, we venture into a wonderful pool of influence that urges us to consider what it is that we actually need for our own happiness and to be true to ourselves. Heart-centered clarity allows you to design your days with confidence. Past the point of no return in our awakening, quite a few of us are eager and ready to express our ideas for expansion and growth. Don't be surprised when you find yourself spontaneously inspiring others with dynamic truth perspectives and good vibrations. Change is presently all about us. You can feel it in the air as shorter days yield to longer nights passing the balance point of another equinox. The color and temperature of the sun's light fluctuates, sending shimmering rays of deep cosmic starlight our way. This is the in-between time, my friends, a time of enchantment and vision. Use it to look at your world with the eyes of a mystic, seer, or poet. Anything that is still painful to your heart is calling for the attention of healing, 
so that it can flow away from you, redefining as a blessing of expansion. The weeks of September have supported each of us to deepen our practice as a living vessel of spiritual awareness. The trend continues this week with the universe nurturing more growth opportunities than usual. Your charge now is to show up and demonstrate the inner strength and authority that has been a constant process for so much of 2011. While life can be tough, you now understand the truth of your situation and must display a power that can be seen, felt, and heard by others without fail. Credibility with the universe currently comes by standing in personal truth with honor and integrity. This is the necessary pathway of awareness on the way to transcending every unfavorable experience in your realm. By and large, to the degree you can detach from external false limiting ideas will the measure of what the universe can deliver in I am noteworthy monies. Remain steadfast in the knowledge of what your soul kingdom needs to anchor its energizing presence within your human nature. Keep following the brainstorms and brilliant illuminations that lead you to the heart and voice of your core. It is only through determination and discipline that the newest spiritual levels of consciousness are obtained. Because of our dedication and application thus far in September, we, through varying and unique combinations of refinements and discernments, have gained more precision, exactitude, and expertise with higher states of awareness and focused perception perfecting our soul congruence and shaping us for the larger life. There should be high fives, victory marches, and loud cheers for the ways we are shining differently, crafting disciplines that eliminate patterns and beliefs that thwart our very divination is no longer a hardship. It's simply a divine orchestration. We have just healed another layer of our extreme electric polarity and patriarchal conditioning that has shrouded our authentic nature. Resistance to having more light here is leaving, and its place is the gotta have it attitude. This is great news because it means we are gaining the ability to see our past, present, future in one sitting, seeing all expressions of ourselves, all apexes, all flaws, all talents, all loves and angers in situations time after time, your multidimensionality, enabling us to choose with full knowledge and a peaceful heart our next expression of self. Waves upon waves of soul groups are spiraling toward transcendence. We love being cosmic transducers of conscious source energy, meaning that we emit and receive the frequency of who and where we are. Every moment our life is handing us the answers and details to our most intense questions and ponderings. There is no longer a wait time between what we experience and what we desire to live. We are now living in the realm of 5D embodied presence, and so the clarity of answers show up as the reality that is set before us each morning. As integrated beings who experience life, heart living, over being taught from the memory head of an experience, we are awakening to our greater role within the evolutionary plane. Who you perceive yourself to be, I am, determines your relationship and identification with everything in the outer world. As we ascend biological matter into a higher state of being electromagnetically, ethically, and psychologically, we master elevating form to its light body presence. This light body system is going to enable us to master our own self-healing processes, extend our lifespans, purify our genetic lines, crystallize our personal energy matrices, telecommunicate interdimensionally, and consciously tap the soul's records of experience through all time. Imagine the day coming where each passing thought creates whatever you need a time when there is never envy or jealousy towards another because all individuals possess the same inherent ability to create. All this and more is going to be easy once the physical is using its light body capabilities. In this new ultra-conscious body, 
we are able to resonate with all the intentions of our spirit-infused mind. If a being holds no expectation other than the pursuit of peace and well-being for all creatures, then they emit that frequency of unconditional harmony and peace. We are just beginning to collectively understand the universal laws of cause and effect. Those that are able must immerse themselves in higher thought and work in order that the light becomes us. We are walking currents of God light, creating a circuit of mastery for the earth. We are stretching humanness beyond its boundaries and complications in order to receive a divine dispensation for the entire planet. You, me, and our neighbor Pete are the holy ones creating a sustainable future for the human race. We are the sovereign initiates of evolution crying for a vision of something greater by assuming the posture of receptive gratitude so that the enlightenment from the heart of the Creator flows to us and through us. I bow my head and heart to the ones who won't settle for what is and are extending past the edges of all that can be seen to bring all our divine abilities into fullness. We are changing the world ultimately moving into an awareness that knows that all life is connected as one. And I can't wait for the ride to go faster. And it's signed, Looking for the Fast Pass Lane, Reverend Angela Paragoff. Isn't that great? So congratulations is what I keep saying. And keep having fun. And I think I may have read this a week or two ago, but I've been using this multiple times, and so I'll read it again. I wrote this actually on September 11th. This is how I was feeling, and I continue to feel this way. My I Am proclaims in co-creation with your I Am that we are victorious. We are of love, we are of peace, and we are free. The light is shining out from us over the universes, and we have overcome the dark as we are light shining brightly forevermore. The deepest of love, grace, and gratitude is exclaimed to us all. Let's celebrate from this moment on for all of time. I love us all. Woohoo! What fun to be here now. And what fun for you to be here now. Much love to you. So I have another Santo song for you. Let's see. This one is titled... Hold on, i got to go back up on my little switchboard here. This one is titled Better Days, so another Santo song.
All righty. Well, much love to you all. I'm not sure what's up for next week. And uh, like I said, we're still here. And uh, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Much love to you all. I think I'll go out with one more Santo song. I actually played this one last week, but I like this one quite a lot. lot. It's called Gypsy Rock from the Amazing Days album. Much love, much light. Keep shining and keep having lots of fun. Be back next week. Thank you.